some of the things that I dealt with during my, my uh, career, which lasted about 12 years in NBA and about four or five years over uh, overseas. I played in China and I played in the Middle East. So there was a lot of different times when, you know, you're going through a transition as well, just playing sports in general. And for uh, a lot of professional athletes, that transition is always uh, one that a lot of people don't see. And number two, that, you've never kind of been in that situation to where, you know, you're preparing for uh, a new life uh, at the highest level, uh, just coming from a background of uh, always being in a situation where my, my parents did a lot of moving. I was born in Pasadena, California, and parents moved to uh, Northern California when I was eight years old. And we did a lot of moving. We're in San Jose, Fremont, um, Santa Clara. We moved like four or five times uh, from, you know, third grade all the way up through high school to where I landed in Fremont, California. So there was always a time for me where, you know, basketball became a safe place for me because no matter where we went, I was able to always to find a basketball court or meet new friends or uh, learn more about the city just through the game of basketball, which, you know, allowed me a lot of the opportunities, uh, like I talked to you before about, you know, playing in NBA or playing overseas. So it was just one of those things that I was always in transition, per se, um, almost like a military kid who, you know, goes to different military bases because their parents are always moving and transitioning so, you know, you find basketball as a safe haven. You, you kind of go within yourself to be able to uh, cope with all the different uh, times in your life when you're moving or you're meeting new people. And, uh, you know, so it's just always one of those things where, you know, you can go long stints where you're isolated. Um, if that's not just by yourself or you're isolated in a new city, you need to learn about it or you get isolated, you know, within your, your new community and you're trying to figure it out. So, you know, I, I was able during this time with the pandemic for the, the last few months to really be able to draw on my past experiences with all my transitions from growing up to my transition from high school to college, transition from leaving early from the University of California at Berkeley to the NBA playing with the LA Clippers, you know, per se. And there's a two or three month period where you have to prepare for the NBA draft and you don't know where you're gonna go. You don't know what city you're gonna end up in. You don't know, you know, what that city's like. Uh, at that particular time, I'd been on a few airplanes just because we flew uh, when I was in college, either to like Arizona, when I, we played Arizona and Arizona State or we moved, flew up to uh, Oregon, we played Oregon, Oregon State out in what back then was the Pac-10, which is the Pac-12 now. So, you know, just not being a well-traveled person at that particular time. And then now you're, you're transitioning from uh, just being in the state of California or a couple of states over to now having a possibility of playing anywhere in the United States or even in Canada uh, because at that time they had the Vancouver Grizzlies and the Toronto Raptors who had just came into the league. And so, you know, you're auditioning for these teams. And this is like 1994 when um, I was making that transition from college into the NBA. And I had two or three months stint where you have to do your own training, you know, learn more about what nutrition is going to do uh, to help you position yourself to, you know, become a high pick in the draft or anything that you can do to get that advantage. Um, and so here we are again in another transition, like every transition throughout my life um, to where you're in isolation almost because you have to find a way to train and be consistent with your training to be able to put on the best performance that you can put on uh, once you get in front of the general managers of particular teams 
and it was really uh, eye opening to understand, you know, all the things that it was going to take to make sure I was at my peak condition without what they do nowadays, where everybody has a trainer, everybody has a conditioning coach, you know, they have three or four people on their team that help them, you know, when they're getting ready for the season or they're getting ready for these opportunities. And you know, like I said, back in 1994, we just had our agent and, you know, he was just kind of going off of information on the team that had the top picks at the time and what their particular workouts would be like. So you would get all this different information about, hey, you know, um, you're going to go, you know, work out for um, the New York Knicks. And Pat Riley is known for his workouts where guys would, they would have buckets on the, at the end of each part of the court because his workouts were so intense. And you have to make sure you come in peak shape because a lot of the workout wouldn't even have anything to do with a basketball you know, to where we other workouts would be more of a one-on-one -on -one contest, like say with the Lakers, I, I worked out for them and the workout was a one-on-one -on -one, uh, workout against uh, NBA legend, uh, Michael Cooper at the time, who won, you know, five or six championships with the Lakers, you know, so each workout was going to be different. So, you know, you really had to dig within yourself to figure out and find the gym's time and understand you had to go run on the track. You had to do a lot of cross training and cross conditioning. And a lot of these things didn't deal with just basketball in itself. Also with some of the workouts and some of the interviews, uh, a lot of times you would walk in and you know, do a lot of psychological tests with the guys uh, to make sure that they're gonna just vet you from inside and out besides you doing your physical for your blood tests all the different things that you would do you know so these kind of type of things a lot of people don't see um you know just going to combines and you know there's three four hundred guys in one room and they got treadmills you know a treadmill station they have an eye station where they, you you know looking at dots you know on a, on a panel and you're watching your, how your eyes are moving, you're doing a psychological tests. There's so much that goes and that's involved with just being part of that whole NBA family because they're gonna make sure they know what, you know, what type of person they're getting number one and what type of uh, player that they're getting number two. So, you know, just not knowing all those things it comes with so much uncertainty, you really have to dig within and you know some of the things that I went through during that time, as well as when I transitioned from the NBA to playing overseas, are you know just some of the things that you really have to understand yourself well enough to know um, how to deal with these different scenarios and situations that would just come up out of the blue. And um, there was no difference when this whole pandemic hit in February in March and we found out that everything was being shut down and everything ground to a, a halt and you know like I said earlier uh, if you couldn't hear me I was in a car with my son who had just came back from Greece and he went through his own ordeal just to get back into the states because the season was cut short since the, uh, the the COVID and the pandemic was hitting really bad over in Europe and uh, he got back within, you know, 48 hours of them shutting down, you know, uh, transportation from the international airports. And, you know, for him, he just getting back into the States was uh, a 48 hour orde ordeal sitting in air, air, you know, airports and everybody doesn't know what's going on. It's panic uh, and get, getting on the last flight that's going to bring you into New York. And then from New York, you have to go into San Francisco and then they're going to do a bunch of screening and tests and not knowing if he was even going to make it back home uh, because they were doing uh, tests. And if they felt that you need to be quarantined, they were just going to just take him and quarantine him or take him to the hospital for two weeks and we wouldn't know what was going on. So, you know, you know, thankfully he made it through that ordeal and got to come home, he flew into San Francisco, they did their tests, he passed all the tests, 
and then coming home and then not knowing how contagious everything was at that particular time. So now here he is coming in from Greece, which at the time was, you know, some of the worst hit as well as Italy, which he, where he played at the year before uh, and, and not knowing him coming home, if he even had it and, you know, just being here at the house with me and, you know, self quarantining for two weeks, we had to really dig deep within ourselves to understand that, you know, like most things, we'll find out more information about it. Uh, we'll understand it better. But right now, this is just a time when we have to do what we have to do. And that's the one thing that you learn uh, when, you're, when you play sports and you transition as, much, as many times as we've transitioned, moved as many times as we've moved. Even when I played in the NBA, it was always a transition. Five years with the Clippers, now I'm going to Cleveland. Okay, never been to Cleveland, um, never lived in the snow, and here we are uh, in a snow belt. You know, what does that mean? Okay, now there's this big transition for that and dealing with, you know, the weather and dealing with different elements and dealing with coming from California and not really seeing the sun for three, four months, you know, being in the Midwest and different states and just all these different things that you deal with. And then I leave from Cleveland, I go into Canada to play with the Toronto Raptors. What does that mean? Oh, that means colder weather, uh, different people, um, and just dealing with that transition and coming back home and people going, well, where are you? Where are you playing? Wow, we didn't even know, we thought you weren't even playing basketball anymore because at the time we were in Toronto, you know, basketball, was big up there. We were almost like the Lakers on every station, different interviews, different commercials, all these different things. But people here in the United States didn't even know what was going on unless we, they saw us come into town to play the Lakers or the Clippers or New York. You know, it just was the, at the time that we weren't televised uh, because the team wasn't in the playoffs at the time. So. You know, there's all these different things that you deal with as an athlete. You definitely understand that with all things, time and change will come. And, you know, like I always like to say, like I told everyone last week, you know, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So there was different things that I did here at home to where I made our transition a little bit better because of all the times that I've transitioned before, you know, little things like once we understood the first two weeks, hey, you know, like there could be a time where you have to buckle down and understand, hey, you know, we really have to go load up at the grocery store. And we really have to go get, you know, as much water as we possibly can get. And who knows how what's really going to go on, you know, in terms of all the things that you're seeing over the last couple of weeks that I think personally um has a lot to do with everyone that's been you know in lockdown in their house and not having that social interaction with uh with everyone um and they're looking at you know the floyd situation and it seems like you know it's all about black lives matters and all these other things but i really do believe it's because everybody's been uh you know, there was no social interactions, you know, and this is everyone kind of letting it all out, but then also at the same time, you know, uh, getting behind a cause that everyone can uh, relate to when we talk about Black Lives Matter and, you know, seeing these same scenarios go on and on and on and on over these years to where it became a big, big explosion of social awareness as well as uh, everyone coming together in their own way, in their own right to, you know, come out and fight for a common cause. So, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with what happened with the pandemic as well and all the last three months of everybody being, you know, uh, cooped up in the house and not being able to get out and touch and feel and be around, you know, um, other people, you know, over the last four, you know, three, four months. And so, you know, it's just a lot, a lot of different things that we've never seen before and that we all are dealing with 
right now, but we always come back to your core and just understanding uh, that who you are, number one, and still being able to, you know, um, dig deep within and find yourself within all the chaos. And so those are some of the things that, you know, we deal with as, as athletes and that we were able to draw up on to where, yeah, it was really hard and the days went by really, really slow. And you're just in the house and, you know, going, you know, if you have a backyard, you're going in the backyard to, you know, make up a workout just so you can still feel like you're, you're moving in life and still feel like you're staying ready for when we do all come out of this whole thing like we've done over the last couple of weeks. And some states and some cities are still doing that. Uh, here in Las Vegas, like they just opened up um, phase two to where they're allowing the casinos to open up um, as of June 4th. And so now we're seeing everybody, you know, still coming out. And like today was our first day being able to go to uh, sit down in a restaurant and have that kind of social interaction that you become accustomed to and you're used to, you know, over the last you know, 15, 20 odd years, like, you know, on a Saturday, you go, hey, I'm gonna go to my favorite, you know, breakfast restaurant and sit down and, you know, have some cinnamon swirl, you know, French toast or whatever it is that you may have been craving. And it just felt, you know, really satisfying and really gratifying and really thankful to be able to do those things that we've taken for granted for so long because it became so common and when it became just a, a common part of life. And, you know, right now is those type of things that we all can look at now and go, wow, you know, we didn't understand how much we missed that until it was taken away from us. And then, you know, what do we do moving forward? How do we, how do we, you know, transition? And some people are wearing masks and some people aren't. And how do we deal with that? You know, some people, some, we get a lot of information about, you know, the mask is doing more harm than is helping. And some people don't believe that. Some people believe that, right? What is true, you know? So, you know, so much going on. And a lot of, you know, a lot of this is just us learning it and going through it for the first time. And, you know, it's just, uh, like I said, some of the things that we can draw upon as athletes and transitioning uh, throughout our whole lives to where we know it's just going to be a small segment of uh, your life that you're really dealing with these these issues and who do you talk to you know who do you you know who do you who is there a mentor that you can talk to that kind of has gone through these things in life and so that's kind of why we're here with this webinar and you know being able to draw upon you know getting some answers for questions that we may have and and you know going forward so at that point i'd like to you know open it up for questions right now like we did last week last weekend and uh see if i can answer some of the questions that you all may have in terms of how you may be able to transition uh, last week we had some really really good questions um we had one person uh who came on and they were talking about you know how do i make this transition i teach uh, and I have my kids that are coming back. What are some of the things that I can do to retain um, the kids that are coming to, you know, coming to my school to learn? And and I told her it was like, hey, you know, some of the things that you can do is, you know, just not making it always about whatever sport it is that you are preparing for. You know, it's always from what I found. Uh, like I said, my son is 25. My daughter's 23 and you know I, as a parent I've gone through situations where they're playing club basketball they're playing club volleyball and you know as a parent what am I looking for out of a program you know and, and the main thing for me is it not always just being about that particular sport yeah we all want to compete we all want to you know be part of you know the club team or the club sport that is really competing at a high level and affording our kids the opportunity to uh, continue their sport past high school. 
so what are the things that I would be looking for as a parent? And the number one thing is, you know, especially for female sports with my daughter with volleyball was, you know, how, who's going to be on the team and how compatible, compatible, because uh, as we all know, most women's sports is not going to be just about the sport. It's going to be about the social atmosphere and do they get along with their teammates? Do they get along with their coaches? You know, how many like-minded kids are on that team? You know, so all these different things, you know, become part of that vetting process when you talk about, um, you know, as a parent, you understanding your daughter and you understanding, you know, some of the things that you know, it's going to make it fun for her and not just always, like you said, being all about just the sport of volleyball, but what kind of uh, outings are you guys doing to teach them other things outside of the sport of volleyball um, to, be, to make them become a more well-rounded well human beings? That's what you really want at the end of the day, you know, and I found that to be one of the things that really helped uh, us navigate through you know, choosing particular club teams and choosing particular teams where she was able to earn uh, a scholarship to play at the uh, University of Long Beach, at Long Beach State. And um, then she transferred to Florida State, but she had a, a really, really good career, a uh, really good volleyball career to where they made it to the tournament. They did all those things that she really wanted to do, you know, as a player. But, you know, one of the things when we filled out those applications and things moving into uh, for out of high school into college was, you know, who are you as a person? You know, how has this sport really helped you develop as a human being? So some of those are the things that, you know, some of the questions that we had last week and some of the things that we we're able to kind of talk about it just not always being about the sport. And that's just how it is with basketball, volleyball, all the different sports, it always becomes you know, how is it really affecting you as a human being and, and some of the things that you're learning through the sport about yourself to where you're able to navigate through life and persevere through pandemics and persevere through these type of uh, situations because these things will happen in life. So with that being said, um, we have any questions? I see Joseph, I see Decant, I see Sandy Kick. Uh, I would just say everything you've said is uh, just very inspirational. Uh, that's definitely something we as a you know, community, society, country, the world, uh, something we need to, we need to go that direction. I agree. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing. All right. Appreciate you being on with us. What's your name? Joseph McGrath. Joseph. Jr. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, I saw when you came on. Thanks for coming on and, and sharing your Saturday afternoon with us. I see I had a question on here. Uh, do you have a question? I think I saw something go across the bottom on a ticker. Uh, someone was asking a question about goal setting and how has goal setting uh, been one thing that's helped us get through uh, everything that we've done in life. I mean, goal setting uh, becomes really the foundation of life, in my opinion. Um, just going back as an as a athlete, as a player, you know, setting goals. Hey, you know what? I want to be a division one basketball player. That's a goal of mine in high school and middle school. You know, how do I go about getting there? Okay. You ask different people, you, you do questions about what is, what kind of my, what's my GPA need to be. And they'll tell you, okay, you need this, you need a 700 score on your SAT. You need all these different things. And then you're able to set what we call small goals to attain the big goal, you know, 10 year goal, as you all know. So um, some of the things that we've learned as athletes, you know, setting those small goals. Okay, I want to become, you know, all, all, uh, all league. You know, then you become all league by averaging 20 points a game. Okay, I want to become all city. Okay, I want to become all state 
loved and I want to become an all American. What are the things that I need to do? You know, and for us, it was okay. And once I got to each level with those small goals, you know, then I was able to attain a bigger goal to where, okay, Hey, I'm top 150 in the country as a player. And then I, I, my ranking is 77. How do I become number 10? You know, you keep on taking those small <laughs> bites and setting smaller goals as you move on. So yeah, goal setting is a major, major component of life. Sound like I had somebody else coming on. Um, anybody else have any questions? I see uh, a lot of people are on today. Hello. Hey, Lamond, it's Leslie. Great to see you. I put it in the chat, but I'm, at, I'm like checking out, so I couldn't put, show, show my um, face. But I wanted to ask you if you could tell an athlete three things to remember along their journey of development, what would those three things be? The three things that I would tell an athlete on their journey. Interesting. Um, one thing I would always tell the athlete is, you know, like, Things are not always going to go your way, number one. Number two would be find someone that inspires you within your sport that you can imitate. Someone like Kobe imitated Michael Jordan and had great success with that. Uh, you know, like we said, a lot of times, you know, um, if you could make something better that already exists, you know, you could find strength and in, in things in that. Um, what would be the third thing? The third thing I would tell them would be, it's gonna hurt, but once you get to your goal, like we just talked about, it's gonna be one of the greatest things that ever happened to you. So I really appreciate you being on with us, Leslie. I remember taking some classes with you back in San Diego, too. So thanks for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. And good to see you. <laughs> I see the green. Let's see. Anybody else have any questions for me? I think we had Alan Goldman. Um, I think I'm starting to catch on the green. Once your your dots green circled, I think that's when um, the mic is on for you. Anybody got? Any Hi, Lamont. Uh, hey, hey, Lamont. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is uh, Alan Goldman, and similarly, I'm in Las Vegas, Summerlin, right now. So. Challenging times with this weather, but uh, great to be with you. You know, I, I'm curious, um, you, you achieved a level of success and peak performance and obviously had to go through immense challenges uh, to achieve what you achieved um, and take the right road. Um, today, uh, when we look at the world and we look at young people, and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of concern and, and, and so forth. What messages and coaching um, could you impart to young people so they take the right road, so they take the high road and you know, they embrace the opportunities of, of life? 
you know, one of the things I think when I look back over my life that I, 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 when I talked about earlier, just having a lot of different transitions. So moving from LA to the Bay Area, eight years old, uh, then moving from city to city every other year, every two years, I'm in a different city, uh, from San Jose to Santa Clara. And then, you know, just as you progress and you move on, you have to really di dig deep at a young age. So whenever I talk to our kids, when we do our clinics with the Clippers, we do our camps in the summer, I always sit down and, you know, no matter how old they are, I always talk to them about embracing the opportunity of doing it now. You know, doing it now. What does that mean? That means whatever you need to do concentrate on it now and do it now so when i was in high school you know i missed out on a lot of friday night dances uh i did go to my prom that was one thing that i could remember but i sacrificed a lot at an early age because i knew i needed to take advantage of the opportunities right now you know if that makes sense and those things may not ever be there again but like it goes back to what we keep saying, hey, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So those were some of the things that I could always look back on is like, hey, I'm riding my bike to the gym right after I get done with my homework to take advantage of that opportunity at 15 years old to get better as a basketball player. Because my goal was to get to division one. And then by the time I was my senior year, Hey, I'm a Division I signed, Division I athlete going to play at the University of California at Berkeley. What are you doing? Oh, I don't know because I was X, Y, Z, taking advantage of, you know, hanging out and partying. And now my senior year is here and I'm graduating and I don't know what to do. I don't know where my next thing is that I want to do because I didn't think about setting a goal and having a five-year goal, a two-year goal, a three-year goal that led to my 10-year goal. So I think that's set me apart. And that's one thing that I always talk about to kids is doing it now and not waiting, whatever that is. So. Thank you. Yeah, no, no worries. <laughs> I'm also from the Bay Area and followed, uh, followed UC Berkeley and uh, just relocated down here so it's a whole different reality coaching that's and, right uh you know it's uh we embrace we embrace the modern world let's put it that way <laughs> well welcome to vegas like me i've just been here two years now and it seems like a lot of californians are uh headed this way so welcome the raiders will be here in a couple of months <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you yeah thank you Hi, Lamont. This is Dr. Fawcy. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? I'm well. I'm a psychologist in North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, in my area yeah. of clinical and sports psychology. And I've been I doing did. this for over two decades now. And what I'm finding is the kids today, they're not as focused and as serious as they were about 15 years ago. Yeah, and for me, I'm working harder trying to help them meet the goal that they said they want to meet. And I'm at the point in my career where, you know, I don't want to fight you for your goals. I don't want to work yeah. hard on you for your goals, you know, but I'm here to help you do whatever it is you want to do. With yeah. that said, since I've been at this for so long, I'm ready to kind of transition to the more serious athletes, which are the professional athletes. Mm -hmm. So what would you say for me, uh -huh. I need to do to get ready to work with that level, to work with professional athletes? Uh, you know what I would say? I, I, I really had an opportunity um, when I was working with the LA Clippers, I talked to a couple of the general managers about, you know, they've doing so many things for the athletes, um, you know, on the court. And they talk about nutrition now, they talk about all these other things, but they kept ignoring, you know, the mental side of the game, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would talk mm -hmm. to those guys. I'm like, hey, you know, what are these guys doing? Like, where's the, the you know, sports psychologist that you guys have in-house that 
helps guys transition, you know, with whatever it is they need to help with. Oh, no, we don't need anyone. We don't want anyone, you know, because it's just one of those things that they felt as an organization. They didn't want anybody else being able to get inside of that player's head to persuade them to do things that they don't really want them to do, mm -hmm. whatever that meant. You know, so it became one of those fights where you're like, we know this is the fight. We know this is the biggest part of sports as we see LeBron James talking about it now. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, mental health, mental transition, Ron Artest, mental health, mental transition, you know, all these different things are with the mental health side. I would say um, it's always going to come back down to the player, the athlete themselves, uh, putting a team together of what they feel they need to be able to perform at the highest level. The teams are not going to do it anymore. You know, they have some programs, as Dr. Fasari knows. She was an NBA. Uh, she actually, that's where, actually where I met Dr. Fasari when we were, I was playing, in, uh, you know, in Cleveland and we were, coming in we're doing our you know our our annual talk about everything within an mm -hmm. hour after practice for two to three hours and guys were kind of like ah, i really don't want to be here but this is something the nba is mandating that we have to do but then we got the time we really didn't understand how important those things really were because a lot of different things that guys deal with when they transition out of the game or into the game that they're not ready for, you know, there's no one there to kind of get them mentally ready for all the things that are going to happen to them and all the different things that are going to uh, come with them being what we used to, what I used to, what someone used to say, Hey, you no longer black. You never, you're not white. You're green. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're green to people now. What does that mean? Oh, well, that's the, all they see is green. Now when you walk into the room, <laughs> you know, so it was just one of those things you're like, wow, and making that transition, understanding, yeah, I guess that's the reality of it. So I always say, you know, guys now that play at that level or guys that are transitioning from college and the NBA, they're putting their teams together. I will say if you have a network or if you can find a way to network and get to those guys, to, guys are understanding now how much mental health and them being able to just sit down and talk with someone about some of the things that they're going through as athletes that's outside of their parents, outside of their agent, outside of the team, you know, how much that can really, really help them, you know, and guys really understand that now. So if you can get to those guys and have that conversation with them individually and try and get on with them uh, as their individual, you know, sports psychologists, I mean, I think that would be the, the main way because I don't think a lot of the teams are really, really embracing it the way they should like they do with everything else. Okay, thank you. Yep, no worries. We have any more questions? Hi, Lamont. Hi. What was the most difficult or challenging time in your career okay was the question was what was the most difficult challenges of my career uh, for me personally I was one of those guys that 
you know, had never really had to deal with the injury. So all throughout college, I maybe had a sprained ankle here or there, never really missed a game. Um, played five years with the Clippers, you know, small minor injuries, a small back spasm here or there. I think the biggest thing that I had to deal with when I had what's called a, a Liz Frank tear when I went to play in Toronto with the Raptors about my eighth season. And there was an injury that I never knew about. A lot of football players deal with it. It's when they, they plant really hard on the turf and a major ligament in the middle of their foot blows out. It's like tearing your ACL in your knee, but in your foot. And they really couldn't see the tear. And when I blew it out in the, like was a preseason game when, with the Toronto Raptors, I, I couldn't even walk. I couldn't put my, I couldn't even put pressure on the foot. And uh, we went in the back to get the x-rays. Like, we don't see anything. Uh, you'll be okay in a couple of weeks. I'm like, well, that's not right because I'm, you know, I can't put my foot down the ground. <laughs> so what are you looking at? You know, oh no, it's okay. We did x-rays. We did the MRI. We don't see anything. So for me, I knew it was a major injury because like I said, I couldn't even put my foot on the ground, put any weight on it. I was on crutches. Um, and I, as an athlete, you think that, you know, I'm playing with the Raptors, I'm playing the NBA, they got the best doctors. And that's further from the truth, you know, and you see a guy like Kawhi Leonard last few years, you know, having this major blow up with teams with the San Antonio Spurs, because, you know, he's like, Hey, I'm not right. Something's wrong. That was the same thing that happened to me. I have a Liz Frank tear. You can't even tell me what the problem is, but you're supposed to be an NBA physician, doctor. Uh, what's going on now? I have to get on the airplane and fly back to LA trying to find a doctor <laughs> on my own to figure out what's wrong with my foot. And here I am under contract with the Toronto Raptors, you know, and that makes no sense to me when, you know, this is the NBA, <laughs> you know, these doctors are parading around in the back room and they're like, Hey, we're with the NBA. We're, you know, I'm the physician for the LA Clippers and, you know, all this stuff. And I can go down to numerous times, different things that have happened to where I'm like, whoa, I have to go find my own doctor. I had to fly all the way to Iowa to find a doctor that deals with this particular injury and find out exactly what it was that was wrong because they were going to just cut me open like they did Grant Hill and figure it out <laughs> on, you know, like you like, you know, a lab animal. So I, that wasn't going to happen to me. I'm like, hey. Whatever it is I got to do, flew to Iowa. You know, the doctor in L.A. that I had talked to two weeks before. So we're going to go in. We're going to clean this out and clean that out. I'm like, clean what out? You know, this is not. <laughs> you don't even know what it is. What are we cleaning out? Then we're going to put five screws in your foot and your ankle. I'm like, no, nah, that's not happening. Then when I found the doctor in Iowa, he told me exactly what was wrong. He, he showed me, he said, a lot of the doctors don't know what this injury is, but I deal with this all the time. I'm the specialist. And he said, okay, we're going to go in. We're going to sew the uh, ligament together so it can heal. Then we're going to put one screw in the middle of your foot to hold your foot so the ligament can heal on its own. After about two months, he put you in the boot. So long story short, the doctors, we think they are. They're not who they really are. They're paying to play. They're paying to say to the doctor of these particular teams, and it just is what it is. And you really are on your own as a professional athlete, like we just talked about when you come to the mental health, when we talk about all these different aspects of, you know, what the public perceives to be, you know, this major sport that's making billions and billions of dollars a year and this commodity that's making millions of dollars a year and you can't even tell me what's wrong with my foot you know small things like that and i can feel when i see Kawhi leonard arguing and not dealing with their doctors going to get his own doctor and then the nba is trying to spin it around and go oh no you know that's not our problem you know, he's making it bigger than what it is. And then now you see him go on and then he does his own management. He does 
He talks to the team. He has to fight with them about, hey, there's too many games in the season. We're doing too many, you know, too much preseason. We're doing you, – you're working us to death to where, you know, we manage this properly. I would be able to play 82 games. But we just can't have us out here in between days to consider days off you know, doing three-hour practices and you guys run us into the ground like a Pat Riley practice. <laughs> Everybody's wondering what's going on. So, you know, that was the biggest thing that I had to deal with, understanding that and taking the responsibility on myself and making sure I got myself back to where I was able to play. Took me a year, took me two years to really feel 100%, but it, it happened, it worked, because other than that, my, my career would have been over in my eighth season and I was able to get 12 in, so. That's awesome. Along those, those same lines, Lamont, and I've had clients who had injuries and they return to play fine, and then some they don't, and it's the mental part that's keeping them, get, keeping them from uh, getting back to 100%. The doctor yeah. has cleared them, x-rays are fine, physically they're totally fine, but yeah. the mental part is keeping them from playing. Could you talk a little bit about your mental journey returning back from an injury? That's what the hardest part was. You know, number one, now you're sitting there. Number two, now the guys are alienating you because you're not playing. Now the coaches are looking at you sideways because you're not playing. <laughs> now the owners are looking at you crazy because you're walking in there with, you know, a boot on. Like, they don't – now it's like you go, damn, like, did you, did you ever care about me? Mm -hmm. You know, so then that weighs on you. And then now, as an athlete, you're always in peak shape. Now you're sitting there, you can't move. Now you're putting on weight. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, now you got to go get a nutritionist to tell you exactly. And now you like you're used to eating two, three thousand calories a day. You know now they're going. You to restrict the calories to you know fifteen hundred and you know all these different things that you're not used to doing and dealing with. You know, and now you the spotlight's not on you as a major athlete. You know, they put you on this pedestal since you're in eighth grade. <laughs> you know, now I'm eight years into my in my uh, NBA career, and they're like ignoring you. And you look at the you're invisible all of a sudden. Oh, does it weigh on you? Oh my God, does it weigh on you? We were just doing things that just the only way you could think of to cope is, hey, you know what? I gotta make myself big myself up in whatever way I can. So now you end up doing things that aren't that you're not used to doing. You're at the club, you're inviting people over that you ain't supposed to be inviting over. Now these people are influencing you. So all these mental things are playing on you. You're self-destructing. You know, it's just so much to go through because of what you're used to. And now it's not like that. And it's just mental torture. I mean, it was just, the, that was the biggest obstacle. You know, you could say, oh, the biggest obstacle was, you know, trying to make an all-star team or whatever it is. No, the biggest obstacle is not being able to perform and play your sport in your prime. Mm -hmm. And that is the, whoo, I mean, it, that was harder than what I went through over the last three months, to tell, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. To tell you mm -hmm. the truth, that was harder. Mm -hmm. you know? And early in my career, it was, it was kind of difficult, you know, you know, I, I knew they were okay to play because the coach told me, but I yeah. had such a hard time getting them to believe in their skills again. I got to yeah. the point, I wouldn't, I wouldn't listen to the coach anymore. I would go straight to the doctor. Is yeah. this person 100% clear to play? And they had to be 100% without a shadow of a doubt. And that way I would know that it's mental because That's in my right. mind, I'm thinking, okay, the coach is saying it's mental, but, you know, and the coach probably know. But if there's just a little bit that's physical and I'm pushing them hard mentally, then I'm going to re-injure them. Yeah. So it got to the point where I would consult closely with the doctor and I would know that they're 100% to clear the play. But it still was very, very hard. It was very hard with some of the athletes that's and a right. long journey for them to return to play. Very long journey. Like, I mean, it's just, it's almost like you just, the outcast, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, you're walking into the facility or limping into the facility or on crutches in the facility. And I mean, guys are walking past you like you don't exist. Mm -hmm. The coaches won't say nothing to you. It was just the oddest thing ever. 
The fans don't even like acknowledge you. Like Lamont, get better. Nothing. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, oh well, next. You know, mm -hmm. you feel it and you know it, and it's bad. It is just terrible. It's just, it's just, it was just so bad. It's just that was a, just the most difficult thing. Ooh, I mean, I was even when I left the NBA and transitioned to go play overseas, and I was out for a year, not knowing where my next team would be, and had to stay ready and be ready and. You know, this team wants you, now they don't. That was nothing compared to, you know, being injured and not being yourself, it seemed like, you know. Mm -hmm. That was really bad, yeah. So thanks for your question. That was a really good one. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think we got time for one more question. Anyone's there? So I think my battery's about to die on my phone as well. <laughs> if no one has one, I have one more real quick. How did you best support your children um, along their journey? Like, what's the right amount to encourage, motivate them, give them the tools, but not to like overbear or, or push them or? How do you how do you parent your kids? Yeah, yeah, that was tough. I mean, my son being a junior as well, so he's carrying your name. You know, everybody in the city knows who you are. He's, and I didn't push it up on him. I'm like, hey man, let's go pick up this basketball and let's go. You know, I let him figure it out. He played video games. He did whatever he wanted to do. But then at the time came when he said, hey dad, you know, I really I want to play basketball. I'm like, are you sure? You know, so I allowed him to come to me and ask, you know, about playing the game. And I think he didn't really start playing until he was 12, which is kind of late. So he's, you know, starting late. A lot of the kids at the time were seven, eight, you know, playing basketball, playing club basketball, playing on teams. And like they do nowadays, it's like, you know, that was that transition, you know, where they took it as serious as I took it when I was eight nine ten which was unheard of back then because nobody cared you know it was just like oh whatever y'all playing basketball whatever and at that time you know once he asked me to do that i just said you know what this is what it's going to take now you ready to put in this work and you got to put in so many hours a day and you have to and you know it became a fight for a little while but you know then i backed up off him so i went hard and then when he decided he didn't want to do it i backed up off him and then he came back to me again then, you know, we found a middle ground, you know, where I wasn't going as hard, but then I was like, hey, you're going to get as much as out of it as you really want to put into it, you know, and he was a late bloomer. He got a few college offers um, and really blossomed in his last two years playing at Pepperdine where he was WCC, play, you know, top player, top scorer, and with opportunity to go play in NBA, did NBA Summer League, but you know, I think a lot of that came down to as well was that we he started so late. He started two or three years earlier. You know, we would have saw that his freshman, sophomore year, what we saw his junior, senior year. So it's always, for me, it was just, and my daughter, on the other hand, I mean, great, great basketball player. And then she just said, you know, I want to play basketball. I'm like, whoa. And she was working out with us and everything. She's 18 months younger than my son. And, um, She's like six foot three, you know, great athlete. She could put her arm, you know, her wrist over the rim and great shoot, everything. Like, it was crazy that, that we, she didn't want to play basketball, but she's like, hey, I want to do this volleyball thing. I'm like, all right, let's do volleyball. Let's go figure it out, <laughs> you know? So for me, my perspective on sports and life was a little bit different to where I know how much work, how much time, how much effort it really took for me to get to where I was. So I didn't want to put that burden on them at a young age where they burn out. A lot of parents would do that early. And I see kids that I was training, kids that I was working with to try and, you know, their parents like, let's go, hit the gym, you know. And they're burnt out by middle school. Eighth grade, going ninth grade, they didn't want to touch a basketball. They didn't want to touch, they didn't want to do anything with the sport, you know, because they're burnt out because they started at six and they really didn't want to do it, you know, so. I got blessed with being able to know what it took and not really forcing it upon my kids and letting them kind of, you know, do their own thing and then kind of tune in when I needed to. Thank you. Yeah.
Well, I guess that's our time. I think it's a little bit after five o'clock. Sorry for the late start uh, for everyone. Uh, just thanks for coming on and um, listening to my story and hearing, you know, things that I've been through. And, you know, hopefully we all can persevere through the remainder of whatever is going on with the, this, you know, pandemic. And hopefully, uh, you know, it doesn't reappear. And, you know, we have to do everything that we've done over the last three, four months. And uh, everybody can move on with their life. Uh, we can get some kind of, um, you know, relief from it to where we come with a vaccine or something that really get everybody back to normal. But, you know, there's some of the things that I dealt with in my life that uh, really helped me get through the last few months. And like we said, you got to, you know, stay ready. You know, that way you don't have to get ready. Um, and, you know, we, we just could keep per persevering and setting goals and having that as our foundation. And uh, like you said, just staying positive and living day to day, you know, and moving forward, not looking too far back in our past. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's the way to kind of, you know, continue to, to press forward and continuing to really um, cope with all the different, you know, things that come with life. So thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone. And bye.